Now let's take a look at the role of the Rothschild family, the family said to be the wealthiest in the world. Money is the god of our time, and Rothschild is his prophet. Heinrich Heine. The mythology surrounding the Rothschild's wealth and power is two centuries old. The resulting mythology has proved almost as long-lived as the firm of N.M. Rothschild and Sons itself. Ever since the second decade of the 19th century, there has been speculation about the origins and extent of the family's wealth, about their political influence, not only in the five countries where there were Rothschild houses, but throughout the world, about their Judaism. The five Rothschild houses constitute an early version of what later became known as the multinational. Perhaps the most important point to grasp about this multinational partnership is that for most of the century between 1815 and 1914, it was easily the biggest bank in the world. Strictly in terms of their combined capital, the Rothschilds were in a league of their own until, at the earliest, the 1880s. The 20th century has no equivalent. Because they were so rich, the Rothschilds could plainly claim a material equivalence with the European aristocracy. They relished the sense that they were sans pareil. In this sense, phrases like kings of the Jews, which contemporaries applied to them, contained an important element of truth. That was exactly the way the Rothschilds saw and conducted themselves. There are no fewer than 153 species or subspecies of insect which bear the name Rothschild, as well as 58 birds, 18 mammals, and 14 plants, including a rare slipper orchid, Caffio pedalum Rothschildianum, to say nothing of three fish, three spiders, and two reptiles. The family's almost equally recurrent enthusiasm for the pleasures of the table has also bestowed the name on a souffle and a savory, prawns, cognac, and gruyere on toast. There are towns and numerous streets named after members of the family in Israel, Rothschild-owned vineyards at Mouton and Lafitte whose wines are drunk the world over, numerous Rothschild-built houses from the Vale of Aylesbury to the Riviera, and there is even a Rothschild island in the Antarctic. At the same time, the Rothschilds energetically pursued and acquired decorations, titles, and other honors, securing the ultimate prize, an English peerage, in 1885. The third generation also threw themselves into hunting and horse racing, those quintessentially aristocratic pastimes. They also extended their patronage to include writers, Benjamin Disraeli, Honoré de Balzac, and Heinrich Heine, musicians, notably Frédéric Chopin and Joaquino Rossini, as well as architects and artists. In more ways than one, they were the 19th century's Medicis. From the very earliest days, the Rothschilds appreciated the importance of proximity to politicians, the men who determined not only the extent of budget deficits, but also the domestic and foreign policies which so influenced the financial markets. And politicians soon came to realize the importance of proximity to the Rothschilds, who at times seemed indispensable to the solvency of the states the politicians governed, and who could always be relied upon to provide up-to-the-minute political news. When the former de Rothschild Frere director, Georges Pompidou, became prime minister in April 1962 and later president in 1969, Le Canard Enchaîné commented simply, RF equals République Française equals Rothschild Frere. Similar echoes can be found in the British press, too inferences were sometimes drawn in the 1980s from the fact that a number of conservative politicians had worked for N.M. Rothschild and Sons Limited either before or after their political careers at a time when the firm was handling a number of important privatizations. In the 1880s and 1890s their advice on imperial matters was sought by both the Marquess of Salisbury and the Earl of Rosebury, Gladstone's successor as Liberal Prime Minister. Indeed, Rosebury was married to a Rothschild, Meyer's daughter, Hannah. Rothschild influence extended to royalty as well. It is extraordinary to find that the family's interests in the financial affairs of King George IV predated his accession to the throne by as much as 15 years. 
How did Meyer Amschel, then the father of an obscure Manchester textile merchant, come to acquire a bill on the Prince Regent? The likeliest answer is that he bought it from the Elector of Hesse Castle, who had made a number of loans to the sons of George III in the 1790s. Ten years later, with Nathan firmly established as a banker in London, the sons of Meyer Amschel turned to these other royal debts with the intention of making Nathan, in Amschel's somewhat old-fashioned phrase, court banker in England. Nor was George IV the only member of the British royal family to whom Nathan lent money in the 1820s. In 1824, for example, he lent £10,000 to the Duke of York, as well as giving him 100 complimentary shares in the Alliance Assurance Company. The Rothschilds also looked ahead to the next generation. In 1816, the only child of the Prince Regent, Princess Charlotte, was betrothed to a minor German prince, Leopold of Saxe-Coburg, the youngest son of Duke Francis Frederick. The brothers at once recognized Leopold's potential importance. Not for nothing did one Rothschild writer of the 1840s point out the similarity between the House of Rothschild and the House of Saxe-Coburg-Gotha, those two extended German families which were to rise from obscurity to glory in the course of the 19th century. Indeed, theirs was to be an almost symbiotic relationship. The 3.5 million gulden lent to the Saxe-Coburgs by the Frankfurt House between 1837 and 1842 was only one aspect of the connection. Of greater importance was the support which the Rothschilds gave to those members of the family who left Coburg in search of new thrones elsewhere. Not that the Rothschilds lost interest in the question of the British succession following Princess Charlotte's death. When the Prince Regent's brother, the Duke of Kent, set off for Germany to marry Victoria of Saxe-Coburg, he took with him a letter of credit on the Frankfurt Rothschilds. When the marriage produced a daughter, Victoria, who at once became next in line to the throne, Nathan hastened to offer the proud father financial advice and his exclusive messenger service. Nathan's sons continued to act as the Duchess's banker after the Duke's death, relaying money to her brother, Ferdinand of Saxe-Coburg. These tenuous links were enhanced by careful cultivation of Leopold of Saxe-Coburg, who later became King Leopold I of the Belgians. Nor was his nephew Albert above turning to the Rothschilds for financial assistance after he became Queen Victoria's Prince Consort. In turn, Victoria and Albert's eldest son was on friendly terms with many members of the family before and after he succeeded his mother as Edward VII. The list of Victorian politicians who were close to the Rothschilds is a long one. Lionel's campaign for admission to the House of Commons in the late 1840s and 1850s enjoyed support from Whigs like Lord John Russell and Peelites like Gladstone, but also protectionist Tories like Disraeli and Lord George Bentinck. They were attracted not only to Disraeli, but also to Lord Randolph Churchill, Joseph Chamberlain and Arthur Balfour. Even as late as the first decade of the 20th century, the system of partnerships continued to function in such a way that English Rothschilds had a financial stake in the Paris house and French Rothschilds a stake in the London house. The history of the Rothschilds also helps to illuminate the long-running differences between British, French and German banking, for the obvious reason that the various Rothschild houses worked in similar though not identical ways in each country. In addition to the inevitable web of credits and debits with other firms which arose from these activities, the Rothschilds also offered to a select group of customers, usually royal and aristocratic individuals whom they wished to cultivate, a range of personal banking services, ranging from large personal loans, as in the case of the Austrian Chancellor Prince Metternich, to a first-class private postal service, as in the case of Queen Victoria. And the Rothschilds were also major industrial investors, an aspect of their business which has often been underestimated. When the development of railways raised the possibility of transforming Europe's transport system in the 1830s and 1840s, the Rothschilds were among the leading financial backers of lines, beginning in France, Austria and Germany. Indeed, by the 1860s, James de Rothschild had built up something like a pan-European railway network 
extending northwards from France to Belgium, southwards to Spain, and eastwards to Germany, Switzerland, Austria, and Italy. From an early stage, the Rothschilds also had major mining interests, beginning in the 1830s, with their acquisition of the Spanish mercury mines of Almaden, and expanding dramatically in the 1880s and 1890s, when they invested in mines producing gold, copper, diamonds, rubies, and oil. Like their original financial business, this was an authentically global operation extending from South Africa to Burma, from Montana to Baku. Unlike modern multinationals, however, this was always a family firm, with executive decision-making strictly monopolized by the partners, who, until 1960, were exclusively drawn from the ranks of male Rothschilds. There are numerous apocryphal business maxims attributed to the Rothschilds. For example, to hold a third of one's wealth in securities, a third in real estate, and a third in jewels and artworks. To treat the stock exchange like a cold shower, quick in, quick out. Or to leave the last 10% to someone else. The economic history of capitalism is therefore incomplete until some attempt has been made to explain how the Rothschilds became so phenomenally rich. All 19th century states ran budget deficits and some almost always did. And it was war and the preparation for war which generally precipitated the biggest increases in expenditure. For it was by lending to governments, or by speculating in existing government bonds, that the Rothschilds made a very large part of their colossal fortune. The answer lies in the way these investments were carried out. Only a few years previously, Meyer Amschel had been arranging payments of some 620,000 gulden from the elector to Austria to pay for troops and horses in the 1809 campaign against France. Shortly after Meyer Amschel's death, his son Amschel was advancing 255,000 gulden to purchase horses for the French army. He simply backed both sides. Such a strategy has obvious attractions, and it was to become a frequent Rothschild gambit in the decades ahead. Amschel was only half joking when he wrote, urging Solomon, Do your stuff. Make the Frankfurt House richer by a million francs, the Paris House richer by a million louis d'or, and the London House richer by a million pounds, and you'll be awarded the Order of the Grande Armée. Such transactions probably accounted for the lion's share of the profits the Rothschilds made in this decisive period. In June 1814, Harris listed the payments they had so far made to Prussia, Austria, the French King, and the British Army. Including money that had not yet been dispersed, the total was 12.6 million francs, and more was to come. By now, the markets were tending to follow the Rothschild lead. As Karl noted, when we buy, everybody buys. This reflected the widespread belief that the Rothschilds were acting on behalf of the English government, and that this was being done in order to force the rate of the pound sterling up, and that we succeeded very well in doing so. But now, let's return to Napoleon, because nothing else in history more aptly demonstrates the ingenuity of the Rothschild family than their control of the British stock market 